Welcome to a solar fault find. I have no idea what to expect on this, but I'm gonna bring you guys with me. Make sure you like and subscribe. Let's see what this solar fault is all about. Wow, that's like the first time I've ever opened this van door and loads of stuff didn't fall out. It's a miracle. So we're gonna take this. This is a clamp meter. We're gonna take this is an earth leakage tester. And we're gonna take this, which is my multifunction tester. So this is a, a fairly new build house and this is the solar circuit, which apparently is tripping. We'll give that a test in a minute. You've got a, an AC isolator here and then from here it feeds up to the roof and I think they've got micro inverters on the roof. So micro inverters are basically, you've got like an inverter for each panel and it's just a way of avoiding having one big inverter. The problem is with that, if you get one micro inverter that's tripped, or has failed then it's gonna trip out the whole system. So my bets, well, let me know in the comments what your bets are on what the problem is, but my bet would probably be a dodgy microinverter. So I'm gonna get the board cover off. We'll do neat or not neat on this uh, new build consumer unit. Oh my goodness, look at that. That is soul destroying. This is what you get with new builds. I mean, a new build is the perfect opportunity to take pride in what you do. Whoever did that did not take any pride. Also, look at this, right? The bus bars are uh, all sagging. So that, the teeth in that bottom of that breaker uh, is quite low <laughs> compared to this. That whole thing needs lifting and tightening up properly. It's just a bit of a mess, really. So I can talk through how a solar system works. So this is the connection to the electricity grid network. The house has a main cutout fuse, then a meter. So that is the main meter for the house. So you've got tails going from the main cutout fuse into the meter, from the meter into the consumer unit, which is this. And these are what we call the meter tails. So those will be coming from the meter, wherever that is, into the main switch of the consumer unit. Then in the consumer unit, you have a circuit breaker which feeds the solar. So that's this, which is a, a 10 amp circuit breaker. So it's obviously quite a small solar system. From that circuit breaker, then you go into a lockable AC isolator, which is this device here. And then from that lockable AC isolator into a generation meter, which is a separate electricity meter that reads how much solar energy you have generated. That is this. So all of that is here at the consumer unit location. So this diagram is correct. Then from here, it goes upstairs to another AC isolator, which is local to where the inverter is. So that AC isolator is upstairs. I'll show you that in the cupboard. And then from there, it goes to the inverter. What we really want to do is break this circuit down into chunks and see where, where the fault is. I would start at that upstairs isolator here and test to the inverter and see if there's an insulation resistance fault there. Because if there is, we know straight away that the inverter is at fault. If there's not a fault there, then we can test between each leg, say from that AC isolator down here to the, the generation meter, we can see if that cable is maybe damaged or something. And we can go leg by leg and just see if we can find where the fault is. But usually it will be with a device, not with a cable, in which case the inverter is the most likely thing to have gone wrong. So for this test, what we're going to do is what's called an insulation resistance test. We basically push voltage into the circuit and then it will tell us if there's any kind of shorts between various conductors. I would expect a low resistance, which would mean that there is a short between either line and neutral, line and earth, maybe neutral and earth, but if it was a neutral and earth fault, it would trip out the RCD. If I ever use terminology that you don't understand, guys, just let me know. I have the tendency to say things like RCD, TNS, EICR, and people are like, what's an EICR? What's, what's an RCD? So I'm trying to explain things a little bit more thoroughly for those of our viewers who are not qualified electricians. We're pumping 250 volts out between these two. You can't really see it, but it would actually spark. But as soon as I move these closer together, I get a low reading, you see that? And if they're directly touching each other, you get a dead, what we call a dead short. 
You can test with this tester up to a thousand volts, but we don't want to pump a thousand volts into the system because it could damage sensitive equipment. So we usually just start by testing at 250 volts. If there's a short somewhere in this circuit, it will, it will read a low reading. What we want, if it's a good, okay circuit, is we want a high reading. Filled with stuff, but this is the real life of an electrician. You want to see real fault finding? Make sure you subscribe to Artisan Electrics and hit the like button for the fact that the boss is still willing to get out and get his hands dirty and do jobs like this. Right, so in here we've got a 2.5 twin and earth cable coming in, that'll be from downstairs. And then going out, three core flex going out to the roof presumably. So what we want to do is test the outgoing cable here between line and neutral, uh, line and earth and neutral and earth and see what the readings are. If the reading drops, you should see it. So I'm going between the earth and the live at the moment, or line. We've got 0.15, okay, so that's quite low. Go to between earth and neutral now. And we got 0.35. So it's still fairly low. Live and neutral, 0.03. So that is almost a dead short. If we go on resistance test, this will actually give us the resistance. So it is greater than 99.9 .9 kilo ohms or thousand ohms. So it's not really a dead short, but it's still quite low. Right, okay, so those low readings give me an indication that there's something not quite right, but it's hard to know for sure because we don't know exactly what the readings are supposed to be on this particular equipment. I'm gonna test the other side as well because we can test now from here down because the other isolator is switched off as well. So if we test from the incoming cable here, that'll test from here down to the AC isolator on the ground floor and we can see whether this cable between the floors is okay. So we've got 999 mega ohms. So this is what it should look like if it's all clear, if it's a good reading. 999 mega ohms, that means, you know, there's no connection between the two at all. If I swap between neutral and earth, it should still say the same. Oh no, it's gone to zero. Okay, that's interesting. This is live and earth, 99. Okay, so we've got a direct short neutral to earth on the incoming cable. It could mean that the incoming cable is faulty or it could just mean that the isolator downstairs doesn't actually isolate the neutral. So the next thing for us to do, we'll leave this one off, but we'll turn the downstairs on. We'll be pay sending power from downstairs up to here, but not up to the roof. So if it trips then, then we know that it's a fault on the cable f between this isolator and the downstairs one. So I'm just taking the cover off this AC isolator down here now. It should be a double pole isolator. I don't know why it would only be a single pole. So double pole means that it isolates the line and the neutral at the same time. If it was single pole, it'd only be isolating the, the line or live. Ah, there we go. Take the cover off that. Okay, so they've just not really wired it up properly, basically. And it's not actually isolating the neutral. They've just put the neutral in a connector block. They should really have done the neutral in three and four, and then it would be isolating the neutral as well. That indicates to me that the reason we've got a dead short neutral to earth is because the neutral's still connected in here, which then eventually, if it's a TNCS system or what we call PME, protective multiple earth, the neutral and earth are actually connected together at the origin of the installation. So that's why we've got a dead short between neutral and earth, but not between line and earth. Basically what that means in my head is now I'm thinking, okay, there's not a fault on this cable. And if we turn this on, I very much doubt if it will trip. What we're gonna do is turn this breaker on now and that will liven up and send power from here to here, first of all, okay? So we do that. That's fine, it stays on, it doesn't trip. Now we're gonna turn this isolator on. So the meters come live. So that also tells us that they've wired first to the meter and then to the isolator. It's not necessarily a problem. I probably would have done it the other way around, but um, let me know in the comments if that's right or wrong, what you think. Now we're going to turn this isolator on, which will then send power from here up to the isolator upstairs. But the isolator upstairs is turned off, so it's not going to send power all the way up to the inverters. Okay, so that's on. It still doesn't trip. So that is definitely telling me that the fault is with the microinverters on the roof, which is why we've got a fairly low insulation resistance reading on those. So that's good. We've narrowed it down. And that's what fault finding is all about, about narrowing things down so you can pinpoint where the fault might be.
So I've turned this back off now. What we're gonna do just for fun to see exactly what happens when the fault occurs, we're gonna turn the AC isolator upstairs on, then we come back down here, turn this on, and if the fault is still there, this should trip. We're gonna turn this on. So that means now the cable from that AC isolator downstairs all the way up to the roof to the micro inverters is, is connected. Now we're gonna turn that back on downstairs and see if it trips. Ah, okay, there we go. So, we've learned something new. So it's tripped the RCD here. It's not tripped the MCB. So that indicates that it's an earth leakage fault rather than a direct short between neutral and earth, um, between live and neutral. Otherwise it would just trip the, this one. So the micro inverters very likely suspect and there's an earth fault on one of the micro inverters probably. I'm gonna need to get up onto the roof with uh, some kind of access equipment in order to do further investigation, unfortunately. Now there is one more test that I can do, which is an earth leakage test. Sometimes with these dual RCD boards, you've got quite a high level of earth leakage, uh, like base earth leakage, and then adding something else to the circuit actually causes it to trip. That is not necessarily faulty, but just has quite a lot of earth leakage by itself. And changing over to an RCBO could be the solution to that. The only way to tell that is if we do an earth leakage test around these two tails. Cameraman Max always comes up with good questions. He's asked the question, what actually is earth leakage? So this is an earth leakage clamp meter. And what it's reading is the amount of current coming up the live and back down the neutral. They should be balanced. If they're balanced, that means that no current is leaking elsewhere. So you should see zero basically zero earth leakage. Now if we turn the RCD on and we turn each individual circuit breaker on now, we should see a little bit of earth leakage on each circuit. So we would expect that to ramp up slightly. Probably need to put it on the 20 milliamp setting. There we go. So we've got 1.3 milliamps of earth leakage. Now this is an earth leakage circuit breaker that is designed to trip when there is 0.03 amps of earth leakage or 30 milliamps okay so here we've got 1.3 milliamps that's fine that's within the standard if we turn this one on we've got 1.9 milliamps turn this one on we've got 2.6 milliamps that's absolutely fine 30 milliamps is the safe limit basically and these rcds are designed to trip at about half to well above half basically of the 30 milliamps resistance now if we turn this on we'll probably find that that earth leakage just goes like way over. Um, what we can do as another test, we can turn these ones back off and just turn this one on by itself and see what happens. Right, okay, oh, that's, yeah, that's turning on now, but then we turn this one on, there we go, it jumped up to 18 milliamps and then it just tripped straight away. So you can see that it's just tripping straight away. If we turn that on, off, turn the RCD back on, then it'll stay on. But every time we turn that on, boom, Whoa. the earth leakage jumps up and it trips down. So that tells us that we definitely got a faulty circuit and not just a high base level of earth leakage. If we do another test on these main tails here, this reads the earth leakage for the whole house. For the whole house, we've got like 3.8 milliamps of earth leakage, which is fine. Absolutely perfect. So my conundrum now is that this is a flat roofed property with no actual access in terms of, you know, it's not been designed with some kind of outside ladder or loft hatch, roof hatch or anything like that. The only way to access the roof is with either a ladder or a cherry picker or a scaffold. So we're gonna to have to find a safe way to access the roof. And obviously that's gonna require an additional visit for the customer order access equipment, which makes the job a lot more expensive. Whereas if this system had been designed with all the equipment that needs possible maintenance being on the ground or in the house, it would be much easier to find and fix problems like this. Unfortunately, when they're building new houses, often they take the cheapest possible route because for the builders, it's all about profit margins basically. And they just throw things in as cheaply and quickly as they can. 
They don't think about people who are going to be coming back to maintain the systems later on down the line. Get up there and I don't think we've got a ladder long enough, but we might, on the other side, there's a, a small roof, isn't there, first and then. Yeah. So we might be able to get a small ladder onto that roof and then from there up onto the top roof maybe. But yeah, I'll see, I'll take a, take a picture of this anyway and then we can plan the safe way to do it. I think it's probably about six meters high or something maybe. Maybe a bit more even. We just need to make sure it's safe for whoever comes to, to do it and then we can get up there safely and do the job. Okay, so I've put everything back off in there for the moment. Just email me the details yep. and then we'll send you a quote for coming back. Okay. Take care. What I'm thinking here is like we can get a ladder up onto that flat roof there and then from that flat roof up onto the main roof and we could probably just do that with normal ladders then rather than having to order some kind of special access equipment. So I think with the double extension ladders we should be fine hopefully. Before we finish I've got something important to do. Let me sit in the van and I'll show you. Ah, so now I'm back in the van. What I need to do is make a note of all this stuff because if you're like me, um, you've got it in your head, but then as a business owner or you know, running your own small business or whatever, you like, you jump onto the next one and then you can forget important details. So what I'm gonna do is write it down and that's where today's video sponsor comes in handy, which is Tradeify. Tradeify is the online job management platform that we use and every job that we book has a job number. I can go into it, so I'll literally do it now. I can go into the job. Now, what we'll do is we'll go into the notes section and I will literally write notes about everything that I have done in there. Whoever comes back, because it might not be me, knows all the information or Chloe or Dan, our estimator, know what to quote for. Um, they know where we left the job, what state we left it at. And I also put my time cards in here so, I, so Chloe knows how long I was here for. Um, so I got here, it started at 10, it's now 10.50. We have a minimum charge of one hour and a half. So it would just be the minimum charge for our fault finding visit today. All of that information can be logged into Tradeify and then it makes our life so much easier keeping track of these kind of jobs. So that is our video sponsor for today. Link in the description where you can get 50% off Tradeify using our special code. So that's it guys. I hope you enjoyed that little solar fault find. We will probably be back there at some point to change the micro inverters and all that. So make sure you like and subscribe if you want to see the next uh, segment of that particular job. Uh, but either way, we appreciate you watching. Thank you so much and we'll see you on the next one.